It's what happens when you close your eyes in prayer. Okay. Good. I'm just going to do the, the unforgivable. No church meeting. It's a change of, change of piece of equipment. Uh, so, that's what my brief is today. Looking at how we do worship, uh, outside and uh, inside, and what worship actually means, etc. It's up there on screen. That's what we're going to be trying to do today. Except that I've got some different questions, because that's me. So I'm going to just share some questions with you, and I think... Ooh. Okay. Press really hard, he said, to get it to go back. Okay. Okay, so what we're doing is this. I want to ask, why do we worship? What's it all about? I, I'm so grateful to Jessica and others who, who gave some replies uh, about that. Why does the Bible tell us so frequently to engage an, in worship and in the practice of worship? Why? Why is worship such an uh, important arrangement between God and us? What is worship? Is it what you've just done, singing? Is it what Josh and a couple of us did, shouting? Is it kneeling? Is it meditating? What does it mean to truly worship God? Is worship something that we do at church? Or is it something that we can do beyond church? Do we do it for a few minutes when we're having our private devotions at home? Or could we do it right through the day? It's a strange thing, isn't it? Worship. And I want to be really honest at the beginning of all this. I am not going to get into worship wars. It's very easy to get into worship wars, and I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to answer whether it's important to have an organ playing or drums banging. I'm not going to answer that. I'm not going to answer whether it's it should be formal or whether it should be charismatic or whether worship is worship or whether it's entertainment. I'm not going to answer that either. I'm not going to answer whether worship is spirituality or creativity or about chanting as opposed to spontaneity. I'm not going to answer it. I know you didn't answer, but just in case you did, I'm not going to answer um, I'm not going to answer whether we should stand or kneel or fall flat on our faces on the floor before God, as a friend of mine has done in the past. I'm not going to answer whether there should be silence or celebration. Because I think that all of those things could be worship. What I will say near the start is that worship is not about what satisfies me or you. It's about what satisfies God. That is worship. So when we are tempted to leave and say, well, I didn't like that song, or I didn't like the way that Mary did prayers, or I didn't like the way it was led from the piano, or the blooming drums were the... That's not what this was for. It was for God. Did you know that? Of course you did. It's about what he loves. It's about what pleases him. It's about what demonstrates our entire love of God. Love is worship. And worship is the language of love and intimacy and devotion and adoration. And right now as we celebrate here today, heaven, in heaven... Do you know what's happening in heaven? It's not waiting for you. Well, it sort of is. And it's not sort of waiting for me, but it is. But what's happening now, at this second in time, is that there is colourful, bright, organised, creative, loud, boisterous, emotional worship happening now! 24-7. You see, when we worship the Lord here on earth, 
this is just the dress rehearsal for what we're going to do in heaven. I say, oh, is that it? No, it's going to be better. Because worship is not static, it's ecstatic. Isn't that great? God gave me that last night. I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> Let me say it again. Worship is not static, it's ecstatic. Thank you, someone. I do try. Okay, now, uh, yeah, so I've got a quote from a, uh, an ex Archbishop of Canterbury called William Temple, and he said, To worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination with the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purposes of God. I like that quote. It takes a bit of digesting. Worship is adoring the Lord, spending time in dialogue prayer with him, taking time to read the Bible, listening to God's voice, glorying in his amazing creation, human, animal or nature, loving the Spirit of God. And it's our privilege and responsibility to respond to God's awesome majesty. And beyond that, to demonstrate in our daily living that work and worship and faith and life are one, not separate compartments. And of course, we recognise that in recent years, there have been many changes in the approach to worship and even in its language. When I started, when I got sent as a punishment to a Baptist church at the age of 10, um, I think what happened in that building at that time would be on a different planet with what's been happening today. Things have changed. It's okay. There is now a wide variety of practice, from liturgy through to, to charismatic, from formality to exuberance, from reformed traditionalism to ecumenical experiments. Our contexts may be different and varied, but God remains the same. And you know what? Little secret. He loves us worshipping him. Sorry, Mary. He loves us worshipping him. He loves us worshipping him. Isn't that great? So how can I love God? Well, worship him. Does he love me? He loves you worshipping him. Let me re-advertise the book that I advertised last time I preached here. It's called Rethinking the Church. I wish you guys had bought it. Did anyone buy it when I advertised it? One person, Ian. It's, it's incredible because the whole of the series that we're going through on rethinking is in here. We're not reading it word for word. We're, uh, I promise you we're not reading it word for word, but the titles are brilliant. And we've got to Rethinking Worship, which is the title today. On page 107, it says this, and I might have a thingy for it. Yeah. While the message is timeless, the method of worship is not. And we have confused traditionalism with orthodoxy for far too long. The dynamic of the church is not in the sacredness of cultural forms, but rather in the venturesomeness. I've never heard of that word before. The venturesomeness of participating with God in the transformation of contemporary forms to serve more adequately as vehicles for God's interactions with his human beings. It moves on. It's not static, it's ecstatic. There's a special handbook that ministers have and some church uh, leaders have called Patterns and Prayers for Christian Worship. It's a great big blue handbook. It's about yay thick. And it's full of things to do when you have to do things like weddings and funerals and baptisms and all sorts of interesting stuff. At the beginning, there's a foreword like there is in many books. And the Reverend David Coffey wrote this foreword, and uh, I have the privilege of knowing David as a personal friend. He's a lovely, lovely Christian man. 
and he writes this. Through Christian worship, we are summoned to meet with God, the God who gives us life the God who sets us free from sin, the God who transforms us into the likeness of Christ, the God who calls us to witness to a broken world, and the God who empowers us to look for the coming King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He goes on, in worship we gather as disciples of Jesus. We open ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit. We offer all that we are and might be to the God of all hope. And when we leave the place of communal worship, our eyes are refreshed to see where God is working in the world and we are strengthened with a new obedience to walk in the words and the ways of Jesus. Do you know, worship means worthship. Giving God worth. Is what we have given God today worth-filled? Worthship. It's a good question, isn't it? But I feel it's probably a bit useless to talk about giving God his worth unless we're able to understand what makes God worthy. So let's take a few minutes, just a few minutes, to biblically examine what it means to give God his worth. And I want to start in the Old Testament. We're not going to read the whole of it, I promise you. Um, I've done a little bit of a survey of it. So in Hebrew, which is the Old Testament... That's the only technical bit you get for today. Or there may be two other bits. Um, There's a myriad of words used to describe the act of worship. (coughs) Excuse me. Besides um, multiple words for dancing and singing and various other rejoicing and even mourning-like moments, movements and noises, there are at least ten words that illustrate worship. And they carry connotations. They are bowing down, falling down for the right reasons, not, dear, where is uh, Brian? Not Brian for the wrong reasons, okay? Falling down because you are so in love with God. Service, labour, making, inquiring, seeking, fear, or ministering, supplicating. And I've written up there, do you notice anything about those words? Every single one of them, every single one has a very physical a very active meaning. There is no state of being in this definition, but a very real and emotional rather than intellectual description of the ways in which we can worship God and act towards him. And the words infer movement, action, interaction, relationship. Good, isn't it? Have you done that this morning? Well, I came here. Okay. It's quite interesting. Well, you say, we're New Testament Christians now. Good. Have I got news for you? You see, the New Testament was written more or less in Greek. That's the second of the three technical bits. And there are again multiple words devoted to rejoicing and mourning type movements and noises. And there are 13 words that are translated as worship in the New Testament of the Bible, most of them indicating actions, such as bowing or prostrating oneself, ritual service, acts of service towards God. And again, again, there is a physicality here that specifies not just our attitude towards God or a vague understanding of him, but our actual day-to-day movements. And it doesn't even include the countless subtle references in the New Testament to the Hebrew worship in the Old Testament. Wow! So New Testament scripture captures the real sense of the word worship in a particular word. Here's the third and last technical bit. It's the word proscunio. I dare you to say that. One, two, three. Proscunio. You have now worshipped God. Because that's the New Testament word for worship. And it covers all sorts of actions and moods and movements and, and, and emotion. Proscunio. And do you know what it means? 
You say, well, you just told me. It means word. No, it means to kiss the hand. So you know he's lost it. No, I haven't lost it. I'm telling you what it means. And I'm going to give you a picture that you may be very, very familiar with to describe worship. Here we go. It's the scene where a man stands outside his girlfriend's window singing a serenade for the whole world to hear. Have you got that picture? I know you want to say Romeo and Juliet. Um, whatever. And he doesn't give the slightest care what others think. He only knows that all the affection bubbling up in his heart can no longer be contained. It's got to be set free. And as he unashamedly looks for the best expression of what he's feeling, he suddenly begins kissing his hands and throwing them towards the one he loves. Go on, I dare you to do it. One, two, three. You did it! I love you. You see, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks of him. He has to let that emotion out because he's in love with someone else. We have to let our emotion out when we're in love with the God who loved us before we loved him. It's the type of adoration and devotion in worship that Jesus described to a lady one day when he met her by the well and there was a, an interaction together and she asked him some technical questions and he gave one non-technical reply. He said, those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. That was it. That was the answer. So the next time you're at the kitchen tap, you can remember that because we don't have a well. We must worship Jesus in spirit and in truth. Now you might want to say, well, what about you, mate? What about, what, how do you worship? What's it all about you? And, and I think of my wife, and I think of my sons, and my daughters-in-law, and my granddaughters, and my deepest love for them. I love them to pieces. I could suppose you could say that I love the ground they walk on. I worship the ground they walk on. Do you with your loved ones? I... I, I said to my, one of my granddaughters this week, I love you to the moon and back. And she gets all embarrassed and giggly. I have two 20-something-year-old granddaughters, and when I say that to them, they look at me as if I'm a sandwich short of a picnic. So, how do I consider worship? Well, I, when I worship, I enter a realm. Do you? I enter a realm of pure adoration of utter devotion, of unending praise and thanksgiving, of resplendent majesty, of utter wonder and total gratitude and sacrificial joy. Do you want me to go on? It's, it, it, it happens. It never used to. You see, when I joined the Baptist church at the age of 10, and I'm now 29, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> you must have misheard it, um, uh, there was no sense of that. We stood up, we sang, we sat, we bowed our head when Mary led us in... Oh, sorry, Mary wasn't there. When Mary led us in prayer. Um, well, you would have been. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you're just a different place. We, we sat silently while someone passed a bag along the row and we put money in it. Uh, we stood up again quietly. And when it was all over, we did not have fellowship. We left. And now look what happens. Chaos. Holy chaos. Loving chaos. Godly chaos. You see, I use scripture in my worship. I use Christian prayers, some of which are written down are very helpful. I use lots of the Psalms. I tune into YouTube Christian songs and I listen to them and, and in the privacy of my room I can groan and sing to my heart's content. I use Celtic Christian prayers. I use some traditional hymns. I occasionally look at art 
and nature and wonder at the presence and joy of God. All of those things have added weight and meaning and depth and movement and vision and emotion and truth and love to the worship that I bring to God. How about you? Is this foreign? It shouldn't be. But it only happened when I got filled with God the Holy Spirit. Until that moment, I just went through the motions. And then God filled me with his love and his presence and his power. And suddenly all that singing, all that standing up, all that passing the bag along the row, and all the rest of it, suddenly came to life. Do I hear a hallelujah in here? I thought I might, possibly. You see, also, we're nearly at the end, by the way. Spiritual uh, um, worship is also a form of spiritual warfare. I read in the Old Testament that when Joshua was told to take the city of Jericho, it was impregnable. It wasn't possible. But God told him what to do. Send an army round and round the, the, the city for seven long days and sing to the glory of God. And that's what they did. And as the, on the last day they sang seven times more than they'd ever sung before and the walls be disintegrated. Spiritual warfare is part of worship and worship is part of spiritual warfare. You say, Stu, that's the Old Testament. Well, okay, in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 16, there were two guys called Paul and Silas and they were missionaries. They were apostles, they were missionaries and they'd been missionaring. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and they got arrested, and they got thrown into prison. But before they got thrown into prison, and literally thrown into prison, uh, they were stripped, they were beaten, they were flogged, and then they were put in stocks with their feet. And it says this in Acts chapter 16. I haven't got the verse, but I, I, I'm going to quote. Uh, here we go. About midnight... Paul and Silas were screaming their heads off in pain and moaning and shouting about all the... Hang on a minute. No, it doesn't say that. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening. And as you read further into that chapter, at the end of all that praising and worship, a mighty miracle occurs and Paul and Silas and others are released from prison in a miracle. Spiritual warfare in worship. Now, as incredible as any of this might sound, God gave us the ultimate, the ultimate example of worship by laying down his life through Jesus. Christ's death on the cross is the quintessential act of worship. It's an ardent display of uh, devotion, an expression of love beyond question. It's utter abandonment beyond all proportions. It's a kiss from God's hand to us. The Bible says mercy and truth have met together righteousness and peace have kissed. In Christ and his sacrifice, we see something truly wor worthy of our worship. Look what happens in the New Testament when folk are asking, what do we do when we come to church? Look what this word says. It says, when you come to br together, brothers and sisters, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Well, Liz, where are you? What would happen if we did that this morning? That there was no order of service because we were going to do what the scripture told us to do when we came to worship. That would give you a shock, wouldn't it? It would give Ian a total headache as he spends hours getting things ready. So, may I politely ask you, and I do mean politely, if your knowledge and experience of Christian worship is only cerebral, head, just head and brain engaged, or 
Is it just emotional? Just soul and feelings engaged? Or is it a mixture, a godly mixture, a healthy mixture of both? Because true, rich worship involves our whole beings, body, soul and spirit. Two young newlyweds were preparing for their very first roast dinner. I've got a picture, but it's not quite what I really wanted. But if your mouth is now watering, so is mine. They were going to prepare their very first roast dinner on their first Sunday as a married couple uh, in their their apartment. And after unwrapping the meat and setting it on the cutting board, the wife chopped the ends off and threw them in the bin. And uh, the husband said, hang on a minute, what are you doing? Why have you cut the ends off and thrown them in the bin? Why did you do that? And, and the lady said to her husband, well, I don't know. My mum always did that. I suppose it brings out the flavour. So the husband wasn't satisfied with that. And he went in the other room and he phoned the mother-in-law, which is always dangerous. <laughs> if you are a mother-in-law, thank you, God bless you. Um, and, he, and he said down the phone, can you tell me why you cut the two ends off the meat before you, before you cook it? And the mum said, well, I'm not really sure. Um, it was the way my mum did it. Um, and it was always delicious. And, and that was the end of the call. Well, the husband was a pain. Uh, he phoned the grandma. And he said, grandma... Um, I've got a really important question for you. You know when you're cooking meat, can you tell us why you cut the ends off the joint before you cook it? I I can't do the voice of the grandma, please excuse me. But she went, oh yes, my dear. Um, I cut the ends off the joint so it would fit in the pan. (laughs) Well, traditions shape our lives. But it's important to know why we do them. Because we've always done it that way doesn't provide enough meaning to keep our traditions from becoming stale or static or meaningless. Meaningless. We may have received our worship traditions from our great-grandparents, but for us to offer authentic worship, we want to understand the meaning behind the traditions. Jesus urged his followers to worship in spirit and in truth. And if worship seems lifeless or dull, perhaps we're just going through the motions instead of being empowered by God, the Holy Spirit. You have been a very patient and wonderful congregation today and we've got 15 minutes before we ever have to go and do something else here in this building So I want to thank you. I want to remind you that God welcomes fresh and creative approaches to serving him. He always wants to use us. He's never used, like he's never used anyone before. Let's let God's Holy Spirit allow us to take risks and try new ways of serving and worshipping him. Because worship is not static. It's ecstatic. God bless you today. Father, write your word in our hearts, please. We had that wonderful reading from Psalm 95 that's absolutely full of praise. We've been listening to some strange stories, especially about the meat. Uh, And yet it has a lesson to teach us. Please let us not get stagnant with our styles of worship and have the courage like the man loving his lovely wife, kissing, kissing and expressing and loving in fresh ways, even if the kids think it's embarrassing. (laughs) In Jesus' name, amen.